There's a question in the review about could the national parks and protected areas do more for biodiversity? And the emphatic answer is yes, absolutely. I think we're in a bit of a crisis in terms of biodiversity in the UK. Since last century we've lost 97% of certain key habitats um, and the ones we've got, as far as I can see, are dwindling in quality even further. So there's a big task to be done. You can stand in places in the National Park and the situation doesn't appear to me to be much better or any different from the situation as it is in the wider countryside. And I'm, I'm thinking that's a problem because you'd, you'd imagine in a protected area in a national park we ought to be doing things a bit better. What I would like to see come out of this review is a recognition that the environment in this national park, the Yorkshire Dales National Park, could be so much better. You'd think that because we were in a national park that this would be an exemplar environment, top notch, full of wildlife. It isn't. There are so many degraded habitats and the facts speak for themselves from the fact that there's no breeding trout in this beck behind me or in the ewer or that the traditional hay meadows have gone to pasture or that there's no birds of prey nesting up on their moors because of the way they're being measured or next to none. We need a better environment. Looking behind me you'll see rolling green landscapes, open moorlands, barns and walls, the kind of stuff that the Yorkshire Dales is really famous for. But I put it to you that what you're also looking at is a desert, a desert devoid of much life, bar the odd sheep, pardon the pun. My grandparents farmed just a bit further up the dale from here, 60, 70 years ago, just as the National Park came into being. And if they looked out onto this landscape, they'd recognize it because it hasn't changed. It hasn't changed one bit and that's where we're failing. In the last 70 years, we haven't enhanced this landscape at all. That is in our primary purpose. Our primary purpose being to conserve and enhance. We're very good at conserving. We haven't enhanced this landscape. And that's what we should be doing. And in order to do that, what we need is more power as national parks. We need power to set subsidies at a local level so that we can incentivize farmers and landowners to improve biodiversity, to rewild some of the land potentially, but also power to um, enforce wildlife crime. There are next to no raptors uh, in the skies around here. When there should be, there should be hen harriers around here, but we just very rarely have any. And the ones that do come and breed here quite often disappear. And we, as a national park, can do very little about it. We are not like American national parks or anywhere else like that where we own massive amounts of land. So we have to influence and we have to work with people and we have to recognise that this is predominantly a farming landscape, a farmed landscape. Um, but I think if, if we could be given um, the powers to, um, to actually run our own versions of agri-environment schemes, that were, we could locally administer them we could locally tailor them to actually the Orchard Dales situation and we could work with farmers um, through payment by results. So we give them the incentives and they go away and they actually do what they need to do. And they know the land better than we do and they go away and actually produce the goods and things that we want. And that's not just biodiversity, it's the flood management, it's the soil management because um, our intensive farming systems are just um, they're not only bad for biodiversity, they're bad for a whole range of public goods that we need to, um, uh, to improve. Farmers and landowners I think they're the people who have the greatest influence in shaping that landscape and uh, 
We're fortunate within the Yorkshire Dales that we've got a very long history of the farm conservation team and trees and woodlands team working with these people. And over time, it becomes easier for people to actually want to engage with us and uh, take on board some of the uh, um, ways of working and, and opportunities. And certainly in terms of the future, uh, where the government's going and looking for farmers, payments to change towards where, the, rather than just getting, for example, the basic payment scheme, which a lot of them currently have and rely on, and in the uplands in particular, they also rely on the basic payment scheme, plus the top up payments from agri-environment. They need to now be able to move to a point where the new, which the new schemes are looking at evolving is that the farmers will actually need to be drawing down, if they're going to draw down the payments, they need to demonstrate what public goods they're actually able to provide in return for that money. And that's quite a change for them, so that's going to be quite a challenge for them to be able to take that on board and be able to adapt their businesses. AOMBs and national parks have the same level of protection of the landscape. But what I'm curious about is why do we have two organisations to do a similar job? I think with the larger AOMBs there is a case for them to be either absorbed into existing national parks if they're adjacent to them or become a national park in their own right. And that way, they will be funded entirely from DEFRA, so they won't be short of money, hopefully. <laughs> and also, uh, they'll be under the same planning authority, and they will have money in which to um, manage visitors better, and also maintain and upkeep the public rights of way. The national parks have a greater pot of core funding, so they're, they're able to build up core staff on the ground and have that core service, whereas the AMBs, a lot of them tend to rely on their partners to provide that as an in-kind contribution and or they're tapping into short-term funding, which is linked directly to project funding with short-term contracts. So the actual core staff teams are a lot smaller than national park staff teams. You know, whether the scope to actually look at both both models and to see whether you should have a consistent model across national parks and AMBs. But also at the same time, AMBs have got used to being quite savvy about how to tap into other funding. So there's a lot to be learned from the way AMBs work as well, that perhaps national parks could continue to evolve that way of working as well, which I know the Yorkshire Dales has already started on that route and is working very well at looking at other funding sources. If we could have some longer term financial stability from government, um, we, can, we can plan ahead, we can have some really big good projects in the park that we can't do at the moment because we're only getting one to three four year settlements. We can only short term plan uh, because we don't know whether we're going to be able to continue on with those projects into the future. So it would be really good if we could have that in central government that they have a long-term plan for us and it's going to be well funded. I think the big issues for the national parks at the moment are a lack of funding from the government. I don't think they have a big enough budget uh, to provide all the services that they should and could provide to the local communities and to people coming from outside of the parks. And also I think this national park and I, I guess a lot of the others have an issue with keeping and attracting young people in the area. So we're seeing a lot of ageing populations. I feel that we have to engage with uh, younger people. Um, we do that through schools. We have a, a, a really good uh, initiative at the moment, which uh, is uh, developing a young rangers uh, uh, service, which has an approach with getting people involved with our work and our partner organisations in the area. And it's just great to see uh, these younger people get an opportunity.
when we're actually looking at why national parks are what they are and what they could possibly be in the future, um, we have to engage with people and not only know what we're there for, but to listen to what their aspirations are for their place, and especially with younger people, because they're going to live here in the future. Even if they move away, they might aspire to come back at some stage. Local transport's a big issue. Um, we have a very particular service in the two dales, as they're known, that, that's Swaledale and Arkengarthdale. That's at the very north point of the National Park. Arkengarthdale, a beautiful area, sparsely populated, good community. So lots and things to do, lots of clubs, lots of societies, lots of activities going on. Good, thriving community, I would imagine it to be. Um, but the larger services, obviously the bigger services, the ones that we all need to get to, the hospitals, appointments, uh, the, the bigger shops, um, when the need arises, they're obviously at a distance away. We do have a very excellent uh, little bus service. Uh, it's not a public service, it's not a private service, it's a charitable uh, offering. Uh, and it's called the Little Yellow Bus. The Yellow Bus is uh, run by voluntary drivers. There is one paid uh, member of staff. And they take people every week on regular shopping trips. If you've got a hospital appointment, you just ring the bus service and they will take you to that appointment. So it's like a posh taxi service. I just think it's such a marvellous service and um, there's, there's no particular funding for these things. Um, but for things that do actually work for people in the places where they live, then these initiatives should be spread out more widely and looked at as a place for best practice. The National Parks already do a lot to provide so many good opportunities for people, especially in terms of recreational activities. But as we start to understand more about the health benefits that being outside and being in the outdoors can bring. I think this is an area that the National Parks can look more into in the future. What is this life if full of care we have no time to stand and stare? That's W.H. Davis and he goes on, I don't know the rest of it, well, but he goes on to talk about looking at sheep and cows and squirrels and what have you. Um, but the point is, it's very easy to forget how important it is and the value of just stopping and taking in what's around you and how it makes you feel, being aware of yourself. And that's what is mindfulness, I think, self-awareness, spiritual awareness. That's quite a topical subject at the moment. Um, the NHS, mental health organisations, Recognising the value of just taking that time out, um, it's cognitive therapy, um, general well-being. Uh, and national parks and any area of protected landscape offer peace, tranquility, obvious opportunities to do that presentness. And I just think that's very important. And I'd like to see those mindfulness, spiritual awareness qualities looked at in any review of a national park. When I applied to work here with the Yorkshire Shells National Park, I hoped that I would be joining a team of people that cared and I've really found that to be true. When working with people here in my team, in the wider authority and when I've worked with people from other national parks as well and people have a lot of knowledge in their specialist areas but they also they really care about what they do. They care about their own work, they care about the landscapes they work in and the wider environment as well. And I really hope in the future that that continues. That's what I would like to see. 
that that workplace culture is able to continue with, with stability.